Good morning, everyone. It's uh, so nice to have you back today. I hope you enjoyed our first session. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Bill McKibben. Uh, Bill is the Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Mid Middlebury College and the founder and senior advisor emeritus of 350.org, the first global gra grassroots climate campaign. He has organized for climate action on every continent, including Antarctica. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience about climate change, and it's appeared in 24 languages. He's gone on to write many more books, and his works appear regularly in periodicals from The New Yorker to Rolling Stone. His most recent book is Radio Free Vermont. In addition to his work at Middlebury College, Bill is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he won the Gandhi Prize um, and honorary degrees from 19 colleges and universities. He was also awarded the Right Livelihood Award. Um, Bill, we are grateful that you are sharing your time with us today, and we look forward to your remarks. Well, Aaron, many, many thanks, and what a pleasure to be with everybody. Um, I, I thought I'd talk for about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, perhaps, just giving us a sense of where we are right now in this climate fight, and then we could um, do questions and discussion. Does that sound reasonable to you? That sounds really reasonable, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, good. Well, look, um, 2020, interesting year in a number of ways, and I, I, I think we best begin by acknowledging um, just what a strange time it's been. The most important thing, Aaron, it seems to me that anyone has said during 2020 was what George Floyd said as he was being murdered. He said, I can't breathe. And people can't breathe for any number of reasons right now. Can't breathe because there's a racist cop kneeling on their neck or because police brutality is stifling their community. Can't breathe because there's a coal-fired power plant down the road and it's the same community as the one with the bad police force. Can't breathe because COVID's filling up your lungs. Again, following the same lines of race and class. Can't breathe because there's so much wildfire smoke in the air that the governor has told you to go inside and tape your windows shut to keep the particulates out. Can't breathe if you're in, well, Delhi this week where uh, the um, level of air pollution was 15 times the uh, World Health Organization standard and the COVID epidemic was at its peak, um, can't breathe because it's too damn hot to breathe. Uh, we set a new all-time world temperature record uh, in August in California when the temperature reached 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's at the absolute edge of the human ability to survive. But the computer modeling makes it very clear that those temperatures will be normal for days or weeks at a time across large swaths of the planet by the middle of the century unless we get our act together extremely quickly. Um, one of the lessons that we've learned this year is uh, something about how much of the climate crisis we can try and solve by ourselves. Um, and the answer is some, but not an immense amount. Uh, new data today actually makes clear that carbon emissions for this year will go down about 9% uh, in this country, which is a lot. I mean, it's the most we've ever dropped in a year. But considering that we've changed our lives in ways that none of us would have thought possible when 2020 began, everybody stopped flying, everybody stopped going to the office, everybody stopped commuting, on and on and on, 9% um, um, is not that much either. And it's a kind of reminder that most of this trouble we face is built into, hardwired into the world in which we live. And to get it out, we're going to have to reach into the guts of that system and pull out the coal and the gas and oil and stuff in a lot of conservation and efficiency and sun and wind. Um, it's a reminder this year that that's possible. Uh, even as 
uh, coal and oil and gas regime has uh, seen um, great falls uh, in terms of use, in terms of profitability, in terms of everything else, uh, renewable energy has continued to expand in the course of this year, which is a very good thing. It's not expanding anywhere near fast enough because we have a deep, difficult deadline that we face. If we're going to be able to deal with the climate crisis, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made it very clear, our, our world's climate scientists in 2018, that the time is very, very short. They said that unless we've made fundamental transformations in our energy system by 2030, then, and they defined fundamental transformation as cutting emissions in half, then our chances of meeting the targets that we set at Paris just five years ago are nil. Um, that's a tall order. And so the question is how to go about it if we're not going to be able to do it just by uh, changing some of our ways of life. And we've changed them a lot this year. We're probably going to drift back to some of the older ways as the economy rebounds. Um, um, what are we going to do instead? And it's there, I think, that the, the most important lessons of the COVID year come home. Um, at root, I think, what we've been reminded this year is that social solidarity really matters. Um, you know, all of us have lived our lives in the shadow of Ronald Reagan, in a sense. Um, and the idea that markets were going to solve problems, that government was the problem, not the solution. Uh, I think I said when we talked earlier that, that you know, Reagan's most famous laugh line always in his speeches was the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, that was not much of a laugh line even in 1980, really. But now it's a kind of sick joke. I mean, the scariest sentences in the English language are we've run out of ICU beds or the hillside behind your house just caught on fire and you've got to leave with the photo album and nothing else, you know. And, and those can't be solved by some more market reforms or um, by everybody pursuing their own self-interest. They can only be solved as COVID can only be solved, as, uh, as our racially brutal uh, policing can only be solved by joint collective action, by coming together in order to, um, well, in order to build the kind of systems, the kind of cooperation, the kind of fairness that we're going to need going forward because these problems are gonna get much harder um, in the years ahead. They're hard enough now, but they're gonna get much harder. What do I mean? Well, I mean that in physical terms, the damage is going to keep spiraling. Um, we should have in our hearts today, people in Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala. Uh, a week ago, 10 days ago, Hurricane Ada hit them. Uh, Hurricane Ada was already the furthest along the Greek alphabet we've ever gone in hurricane uh, in hurricanes. Um, and it did enormous damage. Uh, the estimate in Honduras was that it was something like uh, the damage was equivalent to something like 12 to 21 percent of the country's GDP. Um, compare that to the US in Katrina, our greatest natural disaster, natural used loosely disaster ever. Um, which was about 1% of America's GDP. So that was bad enough 10 days ago. Yesterday, Hurricane Iota, uh, again, extending the record for most hurricanes in a year, crashed into exactly the same spot in Central America. Category four or five storm as it came ashore. It came ashore 15 miles from where Hurricane Theta had, Ada had come ashore 10 days before. The early reports today from the Guardian are that the damage in places like Honduras is about doubled. So 
loosely, let's say 20 to 40% of the country's GDP gone like that in the course of 10 days. Um, those numbers, of course, hide the reality, which is that there are hundreds of thousands of people with nowhere to live, uh, whose jobs are gone, whose lives are destroyed. Um, a reminder, as we need to be reminded over and over again, that the iron law of climate change is that the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you're hit. But a reminder also that there's no place in the world that's separate from other places. Where do you think people in Honduras and Guatemala and Nicaragua with no way to make a living close to home are going to head? And whose responsibility is it really um, that their lives have been turned upside down? Perhaps it's the responsibility, at least in part, of those of us who live in the nation that produced more greenhouse gases than any other. Um, and probably we're going to need that ethic of social solidarity to extend not only to people in the United States, but to people around the world. That's the test we're now heading into. So we've got two jobs loosely, loosely uh, ordered here. One is to prevent, well, one is to adapt to the damage we can no longer prevent. We've unleashed a whole series of changes and they're going to be resulting in the flow of enormous numbers of refugees and uh, fires and sea level rise and all kinds of problems. And we have no choice but to adapt to that and do as best we can to mitigate the human suffering. The other half of the equation, maybe at this point, even still the more important half, is that we have to prevent that to which there will be no adaptation. All the trouble that I've described so far comes when you raise the temperature of about one degree Celsius, which is what we've done to this point. But we're on trajectory to raise the temperature three or three and a half degrees Celsius, even if we keep all the promises that everybody made at Paris. That's how much the temperature would go up. And so we need to do much, much better than that. We need to move with lightning speed in order to keep the rise in temperature as low as possible. Because if the temperature goes up anything like three degrees, Aaron, then we don't get to have civilizations anything like the ones we're used to. The job of all human beings for a while will be disaster response, and then it will be survival. And, and we do not want that world. We want to stay as far from it as we still possibly can. The good news, if there is any, is that it's easier to imagine that than it's ever been before. Partly that's because the engineers have done their job really, really well. The price of a solar panel or wind turbine has fallen 90% in the last decade. This is now the cheapest way to generate power around the planet. Uh, and that means that if we wanted to, we could move with, we could really move with speed in the direction that we need to go. Um, um, there's nothing holding us back except the enormous power of inertia and the power of the fossil fuel industry, which has so far been able to blunt every effort at real change. They're the reason that the US Congress has 30 years into the fossil, into the global warming era, not yet passed any significant legislation having anything to do with climate change. The other reason to feel if not optimistic, then at least um, not completely despairing, is that over that same last 10 years, while the engineers have been doing their job, so have social movements. People have built big movements around climate change. 350.org was an early iteration of this a decade ago, and it's done its part. And now, blessedly, there are so many others flooding into this space too. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, starting in the UK, but spreading around the world. Um, the Sunrise Movement, um, 
and which has brought us the Green New Deal. Um, in some ways, most beautifully of all, the high school and junior high school students around the world who have rallied time and again now uh, with the climate strikes and Fridays for the future. Everybody knows about Greta Thunberg and everybody should know about Greta Thunberg. She's one of the greatest people in this uh, battle and I love working with her. But the really good news is there are 10,000 Greta Thunberg scattered around the planet and they have 10 million followers and they're doing an amazing job. Uh, it's possible that this is the biggest movement at this point in the planet's history, which is good because it's definitely the biggest problem we've ever faced. Now, what do we do in the next little while to make that movement count? Um, had the elections come out a little differently, had Joe Biden been given a strong Democratic Senate to work with, the answer would have been, I think the first job would have been to pass a robust, strong Green New Deal, $2 trillion as he had planned in green energy spending on and on and on and get to work. That seems unlikely to happen now. Um, even if the Georgia runoffs go the right way and everybody should be working hard to make sure they do, um, that would leave the Democrats with the slimmest of margins in the US Senate. One of those votes is represented by the Senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, who's made it very clear he's got no interest in this kind of work. He came to power uh, with a television commercial where he used his rifle to shoot a copy of the uh, climate, trade, uh, climate change legislation then before the Congress. So don't, um, put your hopes completely in there. Everybody's gonna fight and fight hard. And the Sunrise Movement at the leadership of that fight is politically agile, nimble, and adept. And I think that they will do everything that they can possibly do. But a lot of the progress is gonna to have to come around the edges. I think one of the most important places where that's gonna happen is in um, our dealings with the financial community, with banks, asset managers, and insurance companies. About 18 months ago, a few of us started this thing called Stop the Money Pipeline, uh, a coalition of many environmental groups that's going after those big financial players. And we've had some success already. Um, um, BlackRock, the biggest asset manager on earth, the biggest box of money on earth, something like $1.08 on the planet is in their digital vault someplace, uh, said last winter that they were going to put climate at the center of all their decision making. So far, that seems more rhetorical than actual, so we need to keep pushing them. Uh, I began 2020 getting arrested in the Chase Bank branch nearest the Capitol in DC at the launch of this fight uh, to take on the world's biggest fossil fuel lender, J.P. Morgan Chase. It was a, seems like a very long time ago, Aaron, but um, um, you know, Jane Fonda was on the other side of the glass urging us on, it was a good day. And even with the pandemic putting a crimp in certain kinds of organizing plans, nobody wants to do civil disobedience now because the last thing that anybody in America's uh, prison complex needs is some more people coming in from the outside with germs, you know. Um, um, despite that, the pressure has been somewhat effective. Chase announced two weeks ago that henceforth their lending would be Paris compliant, an airy phrase that doesn't necessarily mean very much. And I expect it'll take more people going to jail to flesh it out somewhat. But it's a demonstration that pressure is possible on this crucially important sector. And that pressure should get easier as Biden appoints new officials to the Fed, to Treasury, to the SEC that are willing to start taking this on. We've seen some of this happen in the UK over the last three or four years, where a man named Mark Carney, who was um, um, chair of the Bank of England, um, did impressive work in this regard and began to lean on the financial players to do the right thing. And it's begun to take its toll. We need it to happen fast now. And I hope that this is a place where movements and, and government can work cooperatively um, um, to try and leverage each other. Um, 
I think that it's really important that that happen because remember, as I said before, we have a time limit here. This is the first human problem that really comes with a firm time limit. We need to have moved dramatically by 2030. If, if we don't, then you know we're past tipping points for which there's no return. Nobody has a plan for how do you refreeze the Arctic, you know? And the good thing about Wall Street, if you want to think of a good thing about Wall Street is uh, it works pretty fast sometimes when it works. Uh, you know, an announcement is reflected in stock markets around the world in the course of hours, minutes even. Um, and that's a lot that's a lot more effective, a lot more efficient anyway than than political systems, which even at their best go fairly slowly and in our dysfunctional politics of the moment often go nowhere at all. So it's gonna take a mix of pressures on the two big power centers, Washington and Wall Street to start getting change on the scale we need. And then it's gonna take a lot of international cooperation and rebuilding some of the ties that have been allowed to wither over the last four years. Rejoining the Paris Climate Accords will be a good first step. Um, it was the most shameful act and perhaps of the entire Trump presidency that the country that, well, actually there's too many shameful acts to rank them all, but uh, that the country that had poured more carbon into the atmosphere than any other became the only country not engaged in the fight to do anything about it. Um, that's appalling. And when it ends, it'll be good, but it won't get us where we need to go we need to go much, much farther, much, much faster. It's an open question, obviously, whether we can actually do that or not, but we're at least gonna give it a try now and that we should be grateful for and, and recommit to working as hard as we can um, because we're gonna live long enough to see the outcome here. The next 10 years will tell the story, you know, in many ways, it's our last, decade with, I think, really substantial leverage over how high the temperature eventually ends up settling. So um, that's why it seems urgent to me. Uh, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions and I wanna get to them. Uh, your, your remarks were important and profound and also highlight uh, divisions in our country. There, there are a lot of people who don't believe or don't recognize that it's hard to grieve in all the ways that you mentioned. Um, and Sid Kasky's question speaks to that. Um, the mantra I keep hearing from right-leaning commentators and acquaintances is that climate, um, climate change has been happening since the beginning of climate. They discount the current crisis and they see reports of it as politically inspired uh, for some unexplained agenda. That combined with the fostered distrust of Main Street media is a roadblock to significant political change. Do you have any questions or insight into changing that distrust into acceptance of the problem? Well, so the good news, Sid, at all is that I think we're actually a little further along here than we've been in the past. It is completely true that living in a world that does not, in a country that does not accept reality anymore, um, that is uninterested in fact, that subjects everything to partisan tests, whatever, is draining and, and, um, and adds a whole layer of complexity to what's already a complex and difficult uh, problem. But the polling anyway, indicates that Americans have gotten far more accepting of the idea that climate change is real and that we need to do something we're up someplace near the 70% level, which I think is about as good as we're going to get. Um, you know, there's always, I mean, if you spent the last 30 years marinating in Rush Limbaugh, you wouldn't be able to take this in either, you know, at some level. And I, so I, I, I think that we're, we're probably, and, and, and actually, you know, the week before Thanksgiving is the good time to talk about this. If anybody's still planning to have a Thanksgiving dinner, which is probably not a good idea, um, um, don't, don't, don't waste what might be your last Thanksgiving meal by uh, fighting with your crazy uncle about global warming, because you're not going to change his mind. But it might be worth sitting and talking with your sweet aunt 
uh, who's probably worried about what her grand world, her children or grandchildren are going to inherit uh, because she probably knows that this is a real problem and the job is to activate her to some extent in this fight. Of that 70%, we've got to get four or five, six percent of people actively engaged. And if we do, we'll probably be able to make significant progress because apathy cuts both ways, you know, and and four or five or six percent of people engaged in a fight is a lot, probably enough to to make progress. Um, one place where we can find really substantial agreement and that's useful is a, 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 an affection for renewable energy, especially solar power that runs across partisan lines. When we pull this stuff, it turns out that this is, the, you know, of all the things that we pull people about, this is the thing that people like the most is more government support for more solar power. And it's about 80% of Republicans and independents and Democrats. Uh, I think they like it for different reasons. I think conservatives tend to think of solar power as a way to have their own castle where no one else will ever, you know, they won't have to deal with the rest of the world. And I think that progressives, you know, get off on the idea of the, you know, power of the sun, the warm power of the sun, uh, you know, uh, lighting up everybody's lives and things. Okay. I mean, you know, we can work with that and it's probably a pretty good place to start because it's actually the, the task we need most to carry out in the next little while. And it'll get a little easier because the absolute power of the fossil fuel industry is beginning to, to buckle. Um, things have begun to undermine their influence. One of the most important has been this vast divestment campaign that Naomi Klein and I kind of dreamed up um, eight or nine years ago and has now become the largest anti-corporate campaign of its kind in history. We're at about $15 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have um, divested from coal, gas, and oil. And it's really having an effect. Um, Shell Oil said in its annual report last year that divestment had become a material risk to its business. Good thing, since Shell's business is a material risk to us all. Um, Jim Cramer, who, you know, America's favorite stock picker, you may see him every once in a while when you're flipping through the dials, sort of yelling at you every night about which shares to buy, um, devoted two programs last January before the pandemic to saying, get out oil stocks, this divestment thing has gotten too big. There's too many funds that won't be in them. You're never going to make any money. Um, Exxon which for many years was the biggest company in the world and then was the biggest energy company for decades, um, is, was passed in market capitalization two weeks ago by a company called Next Era Energy, a Florida-based solar and wind provider. Um, and one expects that as those economic fortunes shift, their political power will shift too, although it'll be a lagging indicator because the oil industry is really good at buying congressmen and they will keep at it um, for the foreseeable future. That's the reason that we never you know, get bipartisan uh, agreement on, on this problem. Um, um, but the fight is getting more evenly matched. And I think that continuing pressure on that financial lever, really going after capital uh, is a good way to keep them on the run. Um, thank you. It, this is, I, I, I think the, the answer was somewhat in, in what you just said, but it's just a slightly different look. If we have 70% of our communities believing uh, in climate change, we've, that means the hearts and minds of the people are in the right place. And um, Steve Neems is asking, how do we get the right wing to put science first? Um, and th that might be the, the financial argument. Yeah. You're not going to get the committed right wing to put science first. Clearly, there's a large part of this country that's just decided that science is the enemy in all things. I mean, look, if you've got people who are refusing to wear masks and thus 
putting themselves at risk of dying, um, the odds that they're going to like, you know, start subscribing to science or nature and and reading articles about climate change and getting the right, I mean, it's not going to happen. And the political apparatus isn't going to change quickly either. The, the fossil fuel industry bought a political party, the Republican Party. I mean, the Koch brothers, now Charles Koch, our biggest oil and gas baron, spent more money on the political system than any other human being organization force by far over the last two decades. He owns a political party. Um, so it's not like this is the, the basic dynamics going to switch anytime soon. It's going to be a fight all the way through. So give up on the prospect of converting, uh, you know, hard right wing people into thinking the right way on this. Understand that it's always going to be a battle, but it's a battle that it's capable, capable of winning. And it's a little easier to push around the financial community because they're not as totally invested in uh, fossil fuel. If you're Exxon, you really do fight to the last bridge because you don't know how to do anything else in this world. Your entire expertise lies in digging stuff up and burning it. But if you're Chase Bank, you know, yeah, you make a ton of money off the oil industry. You've lent them a quarter trillion dollars since the Paris Climate Accords. But it's still only six or seven percent of your deal book. You know, it's not going to end your business uh, if you decided to, you know, not participate in the wholesale destruction of the planet. Um, and and though apparently no business person will ever think like this, if you looked twenty years out, it might be a good idea for your business not to destroy the planet uh, over the next little while. <laughs> Um, we have lots of questions about organizing and advocacy. Uh, Mark Indicieri asks, should progressives in America also support progressive movements in other nations? Um, the entire left movement in Brazil, as an example, endorsed Bernie Sanders. And so does international solidarity matter? Yeah, I mean, climate change is the perfect example of, I mean, it is truly a global crisis and it doesn't do any good to win it in one place and not another. So we've got to figure out how to, you know, push for change everywhere. And happily, movements are very uh, international. 350.org, that was its raison d'etre when it began. I mean, we organized our first global day of action in 2009. We had 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. CNN said it was the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. Um, you know, now everybody, you know, everybody organizes now on a kind of global basis. That's what, the, you know, the climate strikes last September, uh, a year ago, September, were the perfect example of that. Uh, you know, Fridays for the Future and, and the youth climate strike movement organized around the world. Groups like 350 kind of provided a logistical backbone to help. And there were, you know, huge simultaneous demonstrations, you know, half a million people in the street in Montreal, uh, you know, uh, 450,000 in Berlin, you know, huge crowds in South America, in Africa, in Asia. Um, and so we've got to keep pushing. It's one of the reasons why it's also so important to push on financial systems, um, because they're very, very globalized. Um, Washington doesn't rule the world anymore, for better or for worse, mostly for better, I think. But Wall Street still does kind of rule the world, along with the city of London and Tokyo and, you know, some money in China. Um, um, that's where the big pots of money are. And, and so all of us together can isolate and push on them. Brazil is a particularly important case because Brazil can undermine a huge amount of all the action everybody else is taking just by continuing to wreck the Amazon which Bolsonaro in a kind of nihilistic fit of vandalism um, um, is clearly doing, uh, you know. Um, and so figuring out ways to help there would be very, very useful. It's very good news that in yesterday's uh, provincial municipal elections across Brazil, the Bolsonaro candidates uh, performed horribly and a lot of good, interesting left candidates did well. Um, um, Brazil's one of the countries that we have to keep supporting 
good movements in every way we can because A, there's a lot of um, good people there at risk, and B, literally they're one of the four or five, six nations that control the fate of the planet. Um, and now to speak to organizing at home and a in in strategy here, um, Headley Frake says, how do we organize in the USA to follow the lead of people in the frontline states who are most impacted by the climate crisis? Well, the good news about the climate movement is that it really is led now by frontline communities and by indigenous communities here and around the world. And so paying attention to what they have to say and kind of following their lead is, I, I, I think, truly important. Um, because they're the, the, they're the people who have the best sense of where A, where the pressure points are, and B, what the, what the possible remedies are here. Um, I take great hope in the fact that indigenous communities in particular are at the forefront of this, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, you know, and people sort of got a sense of this during the Dakota Access Uprising, Standing Rock. But really, if you've been paying attention, that came as no surprise at all because uh, Native groups uh, in this country had been at the forefront of this work before that. And the same is true in Australia, in the South Pacific, across much of Asia, in South America. Um, um, that's who's leading the fight in a lot of cases, parts of Northern Europe. And, and, and that's very good news. So people should dial into that. Follow groups like Honor the Earth or uh, um, uh, Indigenous Climate and uh, uh, Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, you know, leaders like Winona LaDuke or Tom Goldtooth or Dallas Goldtooth. Um, pay attention to what they're saying. Pay attention too to, you know, the, the pioneers of the environmental justice movement who are still alive, still with us and doing really important work. Follow Bob Bullard, Dr. Robert Bullard on Twitter. You know, um, um, Pay attention to the kind of initiatives that are coming out of the HBCUs now. There's a, a lot of really, really interesting work underway and it behooves us all to join in. Um, and I hope that we'll continue to do that. Uh, you, you talked in your opening remarks about how COVID has changed the ability to have action and to protest and to engage in civil disobedience around climate or really anything. Um, Cynthia Evans is asking, are there any action events regarding climate change in the works at this time? Is there anything that our audience could join in? There's lots of things that people can join in. They're not, I think at the moment, they're not for the most part, um, going and doing civil disobedience or whatever. There may be some of that, especially as the Sunrise Movement gets ready to uh, advocate for a Green New Deal uh, as Congress reopens. Um, but until we have a vaccine, a lot of the work is going to get done. What do you know on Zoom, on the online in, in many ways? This Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition has been able to keep really effective pressure going even during the pandemic. And so that's one place that I would turn. But I'd also make sure I was paying attention to the Sunrise Movement. I think there are tremendous movers and shakers in electoral and hence political terms. They came out of these last elections with um, really burnished credentials. Uh, they organized huge um, numbers of phone phone-ins and so on, and they turned out the youth vote in large numbers. And so they, they have the ear happily of the Biden administration. We'll see how much, you know, at the moment they're fighting along with many of the rest of us, a kind of pitched battle over personnel in the um, incoming administration. Um, we need to keep people like uh, former energy secretary Ernie Moniz out of office because they're thinking is archaic. They back in the era where natural gas was a bridge fuel to some distant renewable future. They're not part of the moment in which we live. Um, 
So those kind of battles are, are fully joined. And when Congress reconvenes in the winter, one imagines that they'll be pushing hard along the same path. So I would pay real attention to their work. I, I think they, um, they're the most politically salient part of this fight right now. Um, and that's a good point then to turn to politics a little bit and what's possible in a Biden administration. Uh, Carolyn Weinbaum wonders, what hope do you have that drastic change will occur in the next 10 years considering Biden's very first climate appointee is Cedric Richmond? Yeah, I mean, I actually think that Biden is serious about climate change and that the administration will do a, a more than other administrations have done and we'll be pretty focused on this stuff. That doesn't mean we're gonna see drastic action because drastic action is difficult in a completely divided country where you don't have access to uh, full access to the levers of power. Even things that you can get past the Senate or things that you don't need to get past the Senate because they rely on executive action still have to get past the courts. And I, you don't need me to tell you that the current setup of the federal judiciary, especially the Supreme Court, is not amenable to strong regulatory action, anything else. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a bitch to get much done. Um, and so they're gonna have to try from a thousand different angles and we're gonna have to try and figure out how to support that work in every way we can. Part of it's putting pressure on the Biden administration to do more all the time, but part of it's realizing that just endlessly pressuring them um, to do more, you know, at, at a certain point loses some of its utility when there's, you know, limits on what they can do. Uh, and so we're going to have to figure out how to open up more room for them to work. That's why I stay particularly focused around these questions around finance and money because I think it's somewhat easier, oddly, to take on capital <laughs> directly, um, 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 you know? And, and so it's why I'm so hopeful that one of the places where the Biden administration will do good things is in, at Treasury, at SEC, at the Fed. We'll see what kind of appointments they make and we'll see how courageous those people are. Um, but, you know, Biden, did win some chance to claim a mandate here. In the last debate, he said quite forthrightly that we have to transition away from the oil industry. That was the strongest statement that any uh, you know, presidential nominee has ever come close to making about any of this. And he didn't pay a price for it. I mean, he won oil states, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Colorado. Um, um, so having touched the third rail, he may be able to, you know, one hopes that he will push forward um, and hard. Um, Timothy Havel is, um, as a question, I guess, it's a silver lining um, and how far the silver lining will take us. Um, the question is the only possible, possible good thing about the pandemic is that it's given people a taste of what it's like to experience and respond to a global emergency. To what extent do you believe the public will take a lesson and apply it to the climate crisis as it becomes ever more painfully clear that it's also a crisis, albeit a much harder one to bring under control? Well, it's a really good question. I, I gotta confess today, um, doesn't feel to me like a kind of silver lining. Um, in some ways, the opposite. I, I confess I've been flummoxed by the American reaction to COVID. Um, there are days when one looks out across the country and just thinks that the, we learned too well that our job was to be consumers, not citizens. Um, you know, the, 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 the governor of Vermont, who's done a very good job, I must say, Republican governor of Vermont, um, said yesterday, as he was imploring people to stay home at Thanksgiving, um, said, you know, there's, there's too many people thinking about what they want and not enough thinking about what we need. Well, that's actually 
a definition of, you know, a high consumer society. And it's more or less what they tried to get all, all to do for the last 50 or 75 years. And it's, and I, you know, as someone who loves this country, I find it incredibly painful to watch the level of, of just, you know, sheer, um, you know, whatever the opposite of love for your neighbors is, um, I guess it's the love of yourself. Um, um, and even that perverted to the point where people aren't even, you know, taking care of their own selves. Um, um, something's gone wrong in our idea about what constitutes freedom and things. And that may make it hard to make, I mean, I mean, on the list of things that one has to do in the world to look out for others, uh, you know, wearing a mask when you go shopping is not really on the very hard end of the things that one asks of anyone. And if that's too much to ask, then it may be very difficult to make the kind of changes that we're going to need to make. Um, that's why it's a really good thing that the engineers have done such a good job of getting renewable energy ready to replace fossil energy. Because I'm afraid at this point, it's pretty clear that if we ask people to make serious sacrifices, serious changes in their ways of life, uh, there's not an overwhelming majority who are lining up to do that. Um, I, I would like to follow up. Um, there's been some discussion over yesterday um, about the 70 million plus people who voted for Trump and what that means. And should our focus be trying to, you know, bring them into the fold or should our focus be on the, on the people and possibilities that are already in our wheelhouse? Well, I mean, one of the, one of the problems with uh, elections and electoral politics and stuff is that it, it does tend to um, reinforce in our minds the idea that this is the only way that change happens. And I, I don't think that's true. Electoral politics are important and elections are important and so on. But equally important are big movements that change the zeitgeist. Um, I mean, that's what underlays electoral wins eventually is you know, when you're able to and, and as I say, we've built big enough movements that we're making some of those changes in the zeitgeist. And some of them are coming in other ways. The endless onslaught of fires and hurricanes and so on is, you know, at a certain point, you know, who are you going to believe, Fox News or your own lying eyes, you know? And, and, and so we're beginning to see those shifts in zeitgeist, and we need to make them count in lots of ways. Um, there's a lot that can be done without Washington's participation. I've talked about Wall Street stuff, but there's also huge amounts that can be done in cities and states around the country. If you look at those maps of America and the blue and the red parts, there's a lot of red, but really most of the money and industry and commerce and things is concentrated in those blue patches. And that's good in this case because it means that those states can really make huge shifts on their own. We're watching what's happening, say, in California, uh, which is far from perfect. Gavin Newsom should be shutting down oil wells and stopping fracking across the state of California, which he could easily do today by himself without political repercussion and with great, but he did do a very good thing when he said that California would be out of the business of um, internal combustion engine automobiles by 2035. California is the center of the world's car culture. It's where we learned about traffic jams and dune buggies and muscle cars and every other part of our infatuation with, with the automobile. And so the fact that it's going to be all electric, or for at least for new vehicles in a few years, is a big deal, mostly because of the signal it sends to automakers and things around the world. 
it's not like any car company is going to make one fleet of cars for California and another for the rest of America. They'd go out of business trying to do that. So an important win in Biden winning is that the federal government will stop suing California to keep them from doing that. And four years should be enough to get that off the you know, rolling. Um, and, and hopefully New York will join in, you know. Um, um, and, and those kind of changes can be really important here. So we should be, we should be taking advantage of that kind of blue power wherever it shows up, you know. Um, and part of that is going to just mean, you know, having to, um, having to figure out how to not get entirely cynical about the slow pace of change in Washington and the corrupt Democratic Party and on and on and on. It's hard for me because I feel the same way a lot of the time. But I remember that we, you know, at the beginning of the Obama administration, um, we were dealing with a, a much worse problem, really, in terms of his willingness to take on any of these issues, um, you know, and, and trying to figure out how to put pressure on him, but how to do it without, you know, damaging his presidency, without splitting the fragile coalition that had brought him to power. We organized what I think were the biggest demonstrations outside the White House during the Obama years at the start of the fight over the Keystone Pipeline. You know, we got 1,254 people arrested on his front lawn, you know, um, and, and then surrounded it with tens of thousands of people over and over again. But we managed to do it in ways that I think helped keep that coalition together. We told everybody coming to get arrested that they should be wearing their Obama buttons when they went to jail, you know, um, because the argument was not that we were uh, so much angry with him, is that we were trying to give him to the room to do the thing that we knew he wanted to do. Now, that was a little made up because he didn't really want us there and pushing him and things. But, uh, but that, I think, is, you know, we're going to have to be a little careful um, it's going to be very hard because there's huge pent up demand for action on a dozen fronts. And it's going to be with the Mitch McConnell Senate, extremely difficult to meet that pent up demand. And if the answer is to get cynical and throw up your hands and walk away, then we're going to have more Mitch McConnell <laughs> would be my guess. So, so it's a hard moment. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I want to shift from blue power to nuclear power. I'm looking at the chat and there's uh, there's quite a bit of conversation about the role of nuclear power in, in stemming um, the direction of climate change and in the fight for climate justice. I wonder if you can give us some remarks. Well, nuclear power is interesting. Um, I mean, it's obviously low in carbon. Uh, it obviously carries all kinds of other risks that you know everybody's talked about for decades. I think the reason it's unlikely to play a big role in the years ahead is just that it's incredibly expensive. I mean, the price of solar panel and wind power has gone like this for the last decade, but the price of nuclear reactors just keeps going up and up and up because they're big, huge projects that take forever to build. Uh, you know, we can now build a wind farm they just did, uh, you know, off in the North Sea, that's the equivalent of a big nuclear power plant. You can build it in 18 months. I mean, you can't hardly get started building a nuclear power plant in 18 months. So my guess is it's not going to play an enormous role, but that could change. There are people I trust and admire. Jim Hansen, for instance, our greatest climatologist, who um, um, has long predicted that there'll soon be a fourth generation of nuclear power plants that are small and cheap and not dangerous. And if there are, then that would clearly shift things. But for the moment, it feels like nuclear power is kind of um, uh, a throwback to an earlier era when we built big, massive, a few big, massive projects and connected everything to them, you know, just built big coal-fired power plants or nuclear reactors, whatever, and ran series of lines to them and that was that. 
the energy system seems to be wanting to become more like the internet. Lots and lots and lots of people producing and consuming at the same time. You know? um, so in interlinked you know, millions of solar farms and wind turbines and rooftops and so on and so forth. That's my guess. Um, and I, I think that the investment trends around the world are kind of pointing in that direction. People are putting their money, not on nuclear power, which is a good way to lose money, but on um, sun and wind. So we just have a few minutes left and um, so many questions in the chat that we're, we won't be able to get to. We can share them with you later. Um, but in these last few minutes, I wonder, you know, you have the ears of a really energized audience and we're heading into a political climate that, while maybe not perfect, is slightly more favorable. And, you know, what, what's, I guess, what are your parting words? What, what, what would you like people to walk away with? What, um, you know, what can they do? What possibilities do you see? Organize, organize, organize. Um, right now, around the world and around the country, young people have done a tremendous job of organizing. And I think that probably some of the most important work and work I wanna be involved in over the next few years is actually figuring out how to get uh, those of us with gray hair to be equally good uh, at that, uh, to build the kind of networks that are as efficient as um, a, a, as um, disciplined, uh, as uh, unselfish as you know, people have done at places like the Sunrise Movement, because I think that's going to be really important. That's the um, hardest political block in this country to crack, and I think we need to do it. So uh, that's what one of the things I'm going to be working on um, as as time goes on, and. Um, and I'm hopeful that, that maybe we can get some things going. Um, organizing is always the answer because the zeitgeist always needs to keep shifting. When you're playing for stakes this large, um, each individual battle over the Keystone Pipeline, over the Green New Deal, over the, you know, what JP Morgan Chase is going to do. These are, you know, over whether or not your college is going to divest from fossil fuel. These are all really, each one of them, important battles. But none of them by themselves get you anywhere near where you need to go. So all of the battles that you fight have to together add up to shifting the zeitgeist so decisively that it becomes easier for, I mean, in the end, the fight is over what people consider normal and natural and obvious. And if you can win that fight, then the political and economic battles become much easier. So that's why organizing, I think, remains the sine qua non for, for really making change as fast as we can. I've said before, the most important thing an individual can do in the climate fight is be less of an individual to figure out how to join together with others in movements large enough to make real change. And there's a half dozen of these around the world now, 350.org being one of them, and join in those fights, push hard. Bill, thank you so much for spending this time with us um, and for your important, insightful, and really meaningful remarks. Uh, we're grateful. All right, and many, many thanks to the nation for just being the place where we all turn to figure out what's going on and how it all fits together. Thank you. Um, everyone, next up is our panel on Supreme Court reform with Ellie Mistal, Randall Kennedy, Nan Aaron, and Representative Jamie Raskin, all moderated by John Nichols. <laughs>